you about every 10 laps and let us know how it's going so we can make proper adjustments this first time. 10-4. Just talk, talk, talk. Then it'll run real tight for a couple laps and then it'll do okay. It's weird. So I can't even see straight. I'm so sideways. Drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. 38. We're going to be the leader, buddy. 10-4. God, we got lucky on that one. Good work. NASCAR, one of Uncle Sam's premier sports that over 60 years has evolved into the world's biggest, most successful kind of sedan-based motor racing. There is nothing quite like it for speed, the spectacle and the intensity of the competition. The stars NASCAR has created are a unique breed. Most are hardcore racers who remain true to their speedway roots. It's an exclusive club where membership is earned and prior achievements mean almost nothing. Some Australians have tried to break in over the years, like the legendary Dick Johnson and Alan Grice, but none have made the same impression as Marcus Ambrose. Marcus Ambrose goes to victory lane for the first time in his career at Watkins Glen. It just feels so good to get that off my back, you know. I've come so far for this, and I've never won in America. It just feels so good. I was really lucky with my family and my dad in particular who helped me buy a couple of race cars and helped run them in Australia, and we finished runner-up to Garth Tander in the 97 championship, and... My father actually was a part founder of Van Diemen, the, uh, the, the car manufacturer based in England, back when he was racing in the early 70s. And so he renewed some old friends and some ties and got us a chance to get over there. And, and, and we just went, I just went across just to do 12 months, just to race to see how far and how good I was and, and whether I could learn, you know, whether I could actually cut it. And so we went across there and I just took it race by race and didn't really expect to last more than half a year or six months. And, and just kept going, you know. And we had some tough times over there. I, I, I made some bad choices on who I drove for. I made some bad choices on, on, on what I, I needed to focus on. But, you know, all said and done, I got through a European stint of about four years, learned an awful lot, and came home and was able to apply what I'd learned. It was really my university degree, but there was no master plan. There was no vision. You know, I was racing against guys like uh, Danny Weldon and Jensen Button, who had management companies behind them. They had financiers behind them. Um, you know, they were all set. They were getting paid. They were in the gym, you know, locked in. They had cars given to them. They had everything planned out three, four, five years in advance. And so I didn't have that. But I saw how it was done and really learnt off them how you should really approach it. Every race, every day was tough in Europe. It was where I really learnt, you know, the craft of racing and living as a race driver and, and knowing how to put together your deals, how to present yourself in front of the camera, how to race against the very best in the world and stand up against them, and it was intimidating. Halfway through 2000, I said to Sonia, when we were over there in France living in a, in a small unit, I said, that's it, I've had enough. We're not going to do it, I'm um, doing it this way. Um, let's uh, change tack and uh, come home. Ford breaks through at the creek, and Marcus Ambrose does it in round three. We always knew that um, he, he was very professional, because um, over the years he'd talked to us, and when he was in Europe, he kept in touch and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and uh, the first thing that when we really started talking seriously was he'd made the commitment to V8 supercars. He'd shut the door on the Formula One dream, and that was important to us, and I think it was important to him. The single-seater racing was good, especially like at Formula Three. I'm not sure it really suited my style. Um, you know, I came back into Australian V8 supercar, and it, it clicked. You know, I'm used to, you know, driving around on country Tasmanian roads and you know, dirt and heavy cars rolling around and not handling that well. And, and sort of V8 Supercar really fitted that mould, you know. I, once I got used to the power and I get used to the stopping power of a V8 Supercar, which are both very impressive, the rest was very natural. And I've learned. I've worked on my own race cars. Um, I've driven for teams that are uh, start-up teams that needed that extra bit of driver feedback or control to help gel the team together. And so I'm used to really understanding setups and knowing what I want from a car. 
I might not know what I need to change on the race car to get the feeling I need, but I know the feeling that I need in the race car. And I've got, I've always had that very early on in whatever car I've driven. It's a drag race. Ambrose moves over on him. Scape may just have enough. No, he doesn't. They touch. Oh, they touch big time. We're running into our fifth year with the Stones. You know, you, you got to keep things fresh. Uh, what were we going to do? Were we going to make a change, go somewhere else and probably not go as well? Was I getting frustrated with the sport? I felt a bit closed in. Yes, I was. I was getting picked on a little bit. You know, people were getting the wrong impression of what I was all about. So, uh, you know, forget the stature of being the champion. Forget about, you know, the paychecks coming in the door. For me, it's not about that. And so I was looking for, for a change. I don't know, with decisions like that in the racetrack, I get a stop go penalty and then get knocked off in the first corner. I'm almost pleased I'm leaving the series because, you know, we're not going to lose this championship. We're going to get it taken away from us. Ambrose has had a massive shunt. Ambrose has had a massive shunt. So Greg Murphy's involved. More cars. The track is jammed. The track is jammed. And watch this. Look at these guys. It's on. It's Murphy on. and Ambrose. These two do not like each other. And they are going to have some serious words. If he had carried on in V8 racing, he would have probably needed to have a year off, I think. Um, and so he either needed to do that or have a break. But once he's, he was still on the contract when he um, talked about going and we released him. And it was, it was no use us having driving here for us under contract if his heart or his soul was in NASCAR racing and, and in the next step in his career. It, the ride had been good for him and it had been good for us. So it was, um, it was really easy to support him to make that move. Um, you know, there were consequences. Obviously, you know, I, a lot of Australian fans were disappointed. Um, the series was pretty miffed at the time. Uh, you know, champion saying that he was going to lead the sport, whatever. But, you know, for me, my choice, my family's choice, I think it was the smart one and the right one, and it's paying off. You know, I think now I'm probably a better driver now than what I was in 2005. So, you know, I've got a few years of good racing left, and I just wanted to make every, every season a memorable one, and I don't want to have any regrets. So, you know, when things, they weren't pear-shaped down there, but, you know, I was getting a bit boxed in, a bit frustrated, so I thought, well, I'll make a switch and come across here and treat it like a holiday. Just get away from Australia again for a while, try something new, try a different form of racing. And I honestly expected it to last six months, you know. I'll come across here, test a few cars, do a few races and go home. But it, I, didn't, I haven't gone home yet, you know. I've just kept progressing and kept moving forward and it's been a great story. came together first of all because Marcus is a world-class talent I mean God blessed him with a tremendous ability to drive a race cars uh, we first met in Indianapolis uh, four years ago he just walked up to me in a Ford suite and introduced himself and we started talking had a pleasant chat for about a half hour I was not a V8 supercar fan I'm ashamed to say so uh, I did not know who Marcus was at the time. I went back to my motorhome, looked him up on the internet, and realized that he was a great talent and one of the world-class drivers. So, uh, obviously, the next time I spoke to him, we, we talked a little bit more business than we did the first time. But uh, just just uh, he was bold enough to walk up and introduce himself, and, uh, and we took it from there. I see a lot of people come from other forms of racing and try NASCAR and they go away unhappy. Uh, for Marcus, we really sat down and talked about a five-year plan that we're executing. Uh, first, we brought him over to test. Out there on a racetrack by himself, does he have speed? Does he have a feel for the car? Uh, he passed that test, so we talked about him moving over here and starting at really the lower ranks of NASCAR. We see that number 20 of Marcus Ambrose being his first ever pole in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. Sure been fun, guys, watching him get up to the front of these packs in that number 20 Australia truck because Marcus Ambrose is learning in a hurry. Because I started also at a fairly low level, I mean, the truck series is not the same level as V8 Supercar is. And so, you know, I'd gone backwards a few notches and knew how far I had to climb, but I knew that the end goal was worthwhile and, and was just very persistent and didn't, you know, I was worried. You know, I was worried, hey, I'm crashing these cars. How many more races is, is this team going to give me before they, they tell me to take a hike? And so it was a difficult time, but, uh, you know, those are the times that really make the good times even better. 
You know, trucks are a little easier to handle. They got the long beds on them, a lot of side force, and uh, very close side-by-side -side racing. So it was a good place for him to cut his teeth. Uh, once he proved that he could do that, had several poles, uh, ran up front quite a bit. We said, okay, let's take it to the next level, which is the NASCAR Nationwide Series. Uh, in Nationwide for two years, he was racing every weekend against cup regulars, really cutting his teeth and seeing how he measured up and driving cars that handle a little bit closer to the cup cars. Uh, so we really made sure he went to every racetrack two or three times between testing and racing. We made sure he was in there against the best competition before we took the step to cup. So it's part of a plan. We really are pleased with his progress at the beginning of this cup season. He's doing uh, way exceeding expectations. And, uh, but we fully expect by the end of this five-year plan for him to be a, a force to be reckoned with and, and running up front and winning races. Well, I'm a proud Australian, first off, and you know I'm proud Tasmanian too, and I love my country, I, I love our culture and way of life. But you know, until I really got to Daytona Week when everyone started talking about, hey, you're the first Australian in it, it just never even crossed my mind because um, I just feel like I'm one of 43 guys out there trying to compete, and and that I'm not really boxed in as a, an Australian. I'm boxed in as a as a racing driver in the 500, and we're in you know the biggest stage in American racing, it was, it was fun. Um, but it soon left my mind as soon as I put my helmet on and had to switch into race mode. I've been lucky enough, I've had the same team owners my entire NASCAR career so far. Tad and Jody Schechter have been very loyal to me and I've driven for them in the trucks, Nationwide Series, and now the Sprint Cup Series. Now the form and the associations that we had and the way the team was set up was different. Um, JTG is a marketing company as well as a race team. So the marketing company bring in the dollars and, and they put that to their best program that they can put together. Whether it be their own team, whether it be taking that sponsorship and, and me as a driver and a crew chief and a few other key people into another group. Now to get to Sprint Cup Racing, it was a big jump. I mean, you're talking from a $4 million budget to a $15 million budget. And so all our money went into running the car. I mean, there was a lot that needed to be put together and we, and we just didn't have the resources to throw at it. And so our only real option was to, to join in with an existing cup operation. And so we've been able to, to allow Michael Walshup Racing to stay as a three-car team and have all that continuity with their people and infrastructure in place. And we've been able to get a benefit from that by getting immediate success for performance. In this series, there are no data systems on the car, so a driver's feedback is crucial to how you get the best out of the car and the driver uh, over a race weekend. One of the best assets of Marcus, in addition to the fact that he's a great racing driver, is his ability to verbalise what's going on with the car, to explain to us how the car feels. In his words, he doesn't need to be technical about it, um, but he just explains very clearly and very precisely. It's almost as if he's been pre-programmed to, to deliver this on a regular basis when the car stops. It really does help us tremendously. I rely on instinct and reaction rather than planning and, and, and being prepared, you know? And, uh, and so when I get in those really intense difficult situations where it's a brain strain, you know, I just turn the brain off and just, just go on instinct and that tends to work out pretty well most of the time. His feedback is, is incredible, he gets great feedback, he has very good feel for what the car does and um, in our series where we don't have a lot of instrumentation or data coming from the car, we rely very heavily on, uh, on what the driver says about the car uh, and what we need to do to make it go faster. Scott Pruitt getting all kinds of pressure here. Ambrose going to try him for the lead. Here he is inside. Nice move, Marcus Ambrose. I'm getting more confidence when I start hitting these tracks the second time. With setups that I already know, with experience that we've already gained, I expect to then jump again. So I think we're on track. I'm showing more speed than last year. I'm showing more maturity as a driver than last year. I'm finishing races. I'm passing cars. Um, we're in the middle of it, you know, and, and that's what I wanted to start this year. I didn't want to be 35th and struggling to get into the pack. We're in the pack now, passing cars, mixing it up. It's a good feeling to have that, and, and we've got more to go, but I think we're on track. You know, with truck, nationwide, and, and cup, 
you know, you're only looking at at the most 50 teams per group. So that's 150 drivers. Um, but there's only 50 that make it to cup. So, and there's 100, 200,000 racers that are trying to get there. And for him to make it and to run well and do well, and I mean, everybody's looking at him now, you know, how much talent and desire he has to do this. And, you know, the, the people at the racetrack are realizing how much talent he really does have. Did you lose your mommy, little boy? Do you need to get your diaper changed today? <laughs> Come on by, I'll sign your blankie for you. Look at that, the Australian turtle. <laughs> hey, gosh, yeah. give me a try. Yeah, that's Hop good. along, kangaroo. Kangaroo meat. And I still, you know, feel like Mark Scaife and Craig Lowndes, these guys that, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't got to their level, even though I was beating them on the racetrack. It's just funny how your head thinks that way. And then I come here and I do the same thing again. And I get to a level where I look up to these guys, you know, with Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon. These guys will go down in history as some of the best drivers in NASCAR of all time. And I'm racing against them. You know, it's humbling to race against them because they can, you know, put a whipping on you pretty good. But to be in that level, um, you know, on a daily basis and be rubbing up against them and getting to know them, it's, it is special and it's intimidating and all those kind of things. But at the same time, you've got to forget all that and race them as well. One of the good decisions I've made was choosing the time to come. There was a fresh drive for diversity in NASCAR. I mean, they actually have a drive for diversity program where they're trying to get minority groups into NASCAR. There was a big push for open wheel guys coming into the sport, guys from outside North America coming in. But I think a lot of these guys that have come in from open wheel or from premier racing around the world, they get dropped into a high level, higher than what I got dropped into, and they just sink. You know, they just don't have a chance to really get their head around what it's all about. Very different form of racing, different lifestyle, um, different culture on how to make these cars go and how to finish a race. And so I saw those guys getting spat out of the system thinking, man, you know, I've got to make sure I don't fall into that trap. And so I just tried to stay very, very low key and just, just earn my way through the ranks. Marcus has definitely established himself as a cup driver here. But again, it was the big picture understanding that he had. Uh, you see some young guys or rookies come in and uh, not offer the respect that those guys like Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon deserve. Uh, Marcus was very cognizant that he needed to earn their respect by the way he raced them on the racetrack, give and take. And uh, he's done that, so he's earned the right to be there. And certainly it seems like his peers embrace him now. He's, he's part of the culture. Up front, Robbie Gordon by Ambrose. Who goes back on him? There it is. Couldn't see that coming, could you? You know, uh, I've learned from my mistakes too in the past where I've said things that have inflamed the situation. Um, they have created a grey area that, you know, people can interpret one way or another. I mean, it was pretty black and white. You know, Robbie took me out because um, he was mad at himself, mad at NASCAR and mad at the world. It had nothing to do with me personally, so I just walked away. And I still do that right now. I walk away and just let it be. I mean, Robbie is a unique guy. I'm racing against him every week now, so, I mean, why carry over something from the past that long ago and, and per perhaps start a new feud or conflict that's going to, you know, cause trouble. You knew that there was going to be an attack from Robbie Gordon, the 50. Yeah, 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 I'm devastated. You know, I promised myself when I came to NASCAR that I've been given such a chance that even if I have the worst day, I'm not going to be mad. And I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed, you know. I feel bad for Kingsford Ford, my, my team, you know, it's just uh, this close, you know. An amazing attitude for a guy who's had the heartbreak of the day. I am so committed to not being labelled a road course experienced veteran road ring or whatever you want to call them. You know, I've come here to race ovals and I want to be good on the ovals and I want to make a career out of oval racing. And we've got to string together not just top 10 speeds or qualify in the top 10, we've got to deliver those top 10 results. And I'm getting closer. The team's getting closer. We're gelling as one. I think it's coming. 
and I want to be known as Marcus Ambrose, the NASCAR driver. A complete driver, you know, and not many people have been able to make that transition. He's definitely learning the discipline. For me, about a year and a half ago, I saw him start changing lines throughout a race. You know, the cars don't handle perfectly throughout a tire run, and the great drivers are able to look around on the racetrack for grip and uh, change their lines to be as competitive as possible throughout a run. And the light bulb came on for him on that about a year and a half, 14 months ago, and, and uh, he's really progressing fast now. Uh, I'm racing every weekend. Every race spends about $500,000 US to turn up and compete. If you crash out in the first lap, I've got my own career to worry about. I've got the sponsors to worry about and the people that put their hand up to give me the chance to drive that car. Their jobs are on the line. And when you drive one of these cup cars, it's not about, uh, you know, I just have to make it to the finish and I'll do OK. Every lap, you've got to run to the very edge. It's a very fine line between success and disaster. Very fine line. Oh! oh. Marcus Ambrose is trying to break on the outside. He's going to lose the spot. I guess all of my friends from home will tell you I was pretty much a pushover in anything else but racing. You know, I wasn't... I'm not, like... I'm not out there as a person, really. I'm not aggressive. I'm, I'm passive uh, when it comes to just living life in general. But when I strap my helmet on, I change, you know, and, and I am in control. And I'm at this point in my career where I really have to keep toning it down. You know, I've got to tell myself every time I strap in that race car, every time I get ready to race, just keep a lid on it. Don't, don't get out of control here, uh, especially in Sprint Cup Series, because there are a thousand ways to not finish the race. Um, and over-aggression is, is a primary concern when you're out there of, of, of damaging your car early, getting yourself in trouble, putting yourself in bad positions, just being too aggressive. So i have learning to control it, um, and more in this form of racing than any other. Really, in, in, in V8 Supercar, it was like, get it done for three or four laps, and then it was control. Where here, it's really control up until the last, you know, 20, 30 laps. Marcus Ambrose runs in third. Um, the feeling I've got is that this is such a, a high level. It takes so much intensity and, and commitment um, that I'm, I'm suffering as a dad, I'm suffering as a husband, I'm suffering as an Australian, you know, and so there'll come a time where maybe, you know, when this is finished, I may just need to stop and just, just change course. I personally don't think he'll ever race in Australia again. I think he, if he comes back, he'll buy a farm in Tasmania and you'll never see him again. But um, <laughs> that's, uh, time, time will tell, but um, I, I, I can't see it, no. Depends how long this lasts, but I might say that, you know, if I can survive here for three, four years, um, it may be enough. It may satisfy that, that desire in my stomach and, and I'll be able to, you know, walk away a happy man. <laughs> this hat was actually a competition between uh, Jody Gashek, the owner of the 47, and myself. We've got this little jewel going between the two cars and the loser each week has to wear this hat somewhere sometime. Oh. I actually won this week, but she refused to come down here in the crowd. So hey, oh. I'm actually throwing her to the wolves right now. <laughs> have, you, have you ever got Chip Warren, your, your, your PR guy and team manager, to get him to do it? Well, he can't even understand what I'm trying to tell him. So <laughs> <laughs> I got no chance. Hey, he used to work for NASCAR. What do you expect? Yeah. <laughs>